your spirit, there can be no preaching. We recognize that without your spirit, there can be no hearing. So Holy Spirit, have your way in this space on today. Consecrate my mind and my will and sanctify my lips. Use me now for your glory. Let every demon be terrified. Let every heart be edified. And let God be glorified. In Jesus' name we do pray. And all the people of God say amen. amen. And amen. amen. And may be seated in the presence of our God. Don't fall for it. There once was a tyrant who summoned one of his subjects into his presence and he ordered him to make a change. The subject happened to be a blacksmith and this was his occupation. So the blacksmith went off, he went to work and he began to forge the chain. When the chain had been done, he brought it back into the presence of the tower and he was ordered to take it away and to make it twice the length that it already was. The blacksmith went away, did the job, came back again to the tower. And again, the tyrant ordered him to go away and to double it again in length. Back the blacksmith went. He obeyed the order of the tyrant. He came back to the tyrant. And this time the tyrant looked at the chain. And he commanded the servants to bind the man who made the chain with hand and foot and then cast that man into the prison. In case you're asking me what the point is, here it is. That this is what the devil does with men. He makes us forge our own chains and then binds us hand and foot with the chains that we made and then cast us into our darkness. Now just to be clear today, darkness is not some geographical place that you enter into. Darkness is this idea that there is this partiality or total absence of light. Darkness is not exclusively resigned to a particular place or a situation. But darkness is relative to an individual's awareness of reality and or truth. When we talk about darkness in biblical terms, it's often referred to as wickedness or evil. And it's that spiritual, quote unquote, space where the illumination of reality and truth are void in an individual's life. See, the devil uses the cloak of darkness as an instrument to keep people engulfed and enslaved by the chains that we have made for ourselves. This is critical because if we don't understand what the devil's intentions are, then we will never fully understand the purpose of Jesus' ministry. First John 3 and 8 tells us that but when people keep on sinning, it, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. Now see, as far as we can remember, as far as we go back, sin has always been referred to or defined as acts committed against God, disobedience to God. Yeah. But I want to suggest to you there that, that when, when we fail to live in the freedom that God created us to live in, yeah. we are living in sin. I tell you why. Adam and Eve had freedom in their existence with God. But sin, unfortunately, removed that level of freedom and forced them to live now restricted in their relationship with Almighty God. See, the Bible says they were high, and somebody said high. And so, say what you mean, high. Hiding was the expression of relational restriction that resulted. And whenever our minds are forced to erect barriers from truth and reality, we live relationally restricted with Almighty God. See, this was Paul's struggle with the Corinthian church and the Christians at home. These new believers were being renewed by the Holy Spirit of God. 
but they were now engulfed, Mark, in a struggle against the immoral influences of the culture that was surrounding them. As a result of this ongoing struggle with the presence and the influence of false teachers and false ideologies, Paul is now forced to defend his spiritual apostolic authority and the, the truth of God and the lives of God's people. The text opens with the assumption that Paul is arguing against the allegation of his opponents who now raise some questions about the validity of Paul's ministry, the validity of what Paul was doing, and also raising questions about the truth of Almighty God. Y'all see right there, I'm going to get you. The suggestion here is that Paul, they suggest that Paul only puts on a bold face when he's absent from them, but when Paul shows up, Paul is really a weak person when he shows up in the flesh. In essence, they, the destructors of Paul were saying that Paul lacked real courage. Uh -huh. They said that he hides behind the pen, but when he shows up, he ain't nothing but a whip. You to go to your neighbor and say, he ain't talking about me, amen. See, see Michael as a coward, Paul now feels the need to not argue about this false claim about his reality, but instead Paul presses the claim to let them know about the truth of not, not only his ministry, but the truth of Almighty God. Yeah. Paul says, I'm not going to jump in the water with you just because you want me to jump in the water with you. And his decision, I'm going to help somebody, his decision reminds us to the truth that you don't have to always waste your time validating the ignorance of those folk who don't know you. Hallelujah. Okay, I thought I would have got a better hour right see, see, Paul refuses to act according to the flesh. He says we live in the flesh, but we don't wage war in the flesh. So he says, I'm not going to get in my flesh to deal with you because you got in your flesh. I, you want to walk your neighbor and sometimes you pay it. And you see, see, Paul understands that his weapons have more power through God than they do through him. That's why he declares in verses 3 through 4, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reason and to destroy false argument. Paul is saying the conflict I'm engaged in is not dependent upon my flesh, but the conflict I'm engaged in is dependent upon the Spirit of God that's at work in me. In other words, in order for me to handle what I'm in right now, my flesh won't help me. But I have to rely on something greater than my flesh, and that is the Spirit of God. Greater is He that's in me than he that is in the world. See, for Paul, Paul recognized this for what it was. This was a deceptive trick of the devil trying to deny the work that God had already done in the lives of God's people and the work that God was still doing in their lives. Because he who has begun a good work in him shall complete it until the day of Jesus. Paul hears the argument, and then Paul sends instructions to those Christians. And even though most of the believers believe and receive his words, because you do recognize that only a handful of folk are going to believe and receive what God has to say. A, a, a few folk believe, and there are still some false teachers who continue to slander Paul's name and to devalue the authority that Paul had as a servant of God. Now there was a segment of the population within the faith community that was designed and aimed and bent on twisting the truth. Some refused to believe that Christianity was not and is not an exclusive club for a select few. Some refused to believe that religion was used and is still being used to encourage, to endorse, and to enforce racism. Some refuse to believe that God 
God was not, and that God is still not defined by any particular race, creed, or ethnicity, but that God is spirit. So refuse to believe that God was not, and God is not only concerned about adherence to the law, but God is also concerned about the demonstration of love. Y'all not talking about it. Some refuse to believe that God was, and God still is, a pro-choice God. Even though God told Moses in Deuteronomy 30, 19, come on in here, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Y'all bump your neighbor and say he's preaching better than you shout. He called the thing is spiritual and apostolic of heart. He does not call for the lies that were being told about him and the lies being told about God. Paul takes a stand to defend the truth of God. And let me help you understand something because I know you got faith. I know you shout. I know you holler. I know you say all the right amens at the right space. But there will come a point in your journey where you're going to have to defend the truth that you believe about the Almighty God. I know they won't tell you that because they want you to believe what they want you to believe. But you have to learn in this hour to hold on to what you believe. And if you don't have no conviction for yourself, you will find yourself tossed and turned like a leaf on a tree. You're going to bump your neighbor and say, I ain't falling off no shit in And Paul tells them, don't fall for it. So the question has to be raised, how do you not fall for all the junk that's being propagated in this hour? I'm glad you asked. The first thing you have to do is you have to give evidence of God's concern for your well-doing. Okay, it's in the Bible. Verses 7 through 8. This is what he said. He says, look at the obvious facts. I can stop right there. Uh -huh. Those who say they belong to Christ oh. must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. Oh. I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but this is what he says. Our authority builds you up. It doesn't tear you down. So I will not be ashamed of using my authority. What's he saying? He said that the work that God is doing, not only in me, but in you, yes. is the work that's building you up Jesus. and not tearing you down. And if you can look at your life, God help me right through here, and see the stuff that God is doing that's made your life better. Yes. That's evidence of the good that God is doing in your life, and that's how you defend the truth of God. God is going to always be concerned about your well-being. God is not going to be concerned about how somebody restricts your living. God is not going to be concerned about how somebody enslaves you. God is not going to be concerned about how somebody keeps you from living the life God has called you to live. God is concerned about your well-being. And any other ideology that does not promote life is not an ideology that comes from God. Paul said, if you want to prove whether or not your critics belong to Christ, don't look at what they say. Look at what God is doing down in your life. And every now and then, you've got to pause long enough to look in the mirror and look at the obvious facts. I should have lost my mind, but I still have my mind. I should have been dead a long time ago, but I'm still alive. All my stuff ain't working right, but praise be unto God. Something is going right in my life because He is always working things out for my good. Faith does not mean that you won't have problems in life. Faith does not mean everything's going to always go the way you want to go. And if you listen to folk who tell you, well, if you had faith, you wouldn't have no problems, and you start, and you start questioning whether or not your trust in God is real, because Jesus had problems. I can't get no help on Sunday morning. Jesus had power. And if Jesus had power, he had, and nobody had more faith than Jesus. And Jesus had power. You gotta pause sometimes to say, I ain't falling for that open door. And you don't 
don't call for it by giving evidence. You got to remind yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You have to remind yourself every now and again of what God is doing in your life that's making your life better. Yeah. Yeah. Are you being built up or are you constantly being torn down by a God that you put your faith in? No, no, no. no. Look, because Paul had told them previously in 1 Corinthians 4 20 that the kingdom of God, here it is, is not just a lot of talk. The kingdom of God is living by God's power. And if you can testify to the power of God that's at work in your life, that's how you stand up against the lies that tells you anything contrary about the God that you come to accept and embrace. The Corinthians had seen the power of God at work through the ministry of Paul because they had become transformed in their living as a result of the Holy Spirit. They had witnessed for themselves how God has now impacted their lives for the better through Paul's ministry. God's ministry will always seek to improve the quality of your life. And anything or anybody that tries to deny you life is not sent to you by God. Paul says, look at what God has been doing in your life. Through the ministry, God has used me to function in your life. And, and let that be the determining factor of what's truthful and what's not. Again, the truth about God is that God is always concerned about your well-being. Okay, I'll give you Bible. So I don't know like Bible. Jesus said to John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose, he says, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And Paul says, I don't stand on what they stand on. I stand on the ministry of Jesus. Because Paul knew Jesus for himself. Because it was Jesus who altered the trajectory of Paul's life. Paul said, I stand for one who delivered me from the cave of religious arrogance and brought me to a place of spiritual awakening. He says, you don't base your understanding of God by what they tell you. You base your understanding of God on how God deals with, how God interacts with, and how God treats all of humanity. He got the fall for it. He gives the first evidence of God's concern for their well-being. And, and then he says, in order to not fall for it, here it is. Don't play the comparison game. Um, that's right. That's right. Hello. I'm glad you all are Jesus. Listen to verse 12. He says, Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. But they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measure. And then he gets in this. He says, how ignorant. <laughs> Nothing can be more tragic and more ignorant than to compare yourself oh, no. to somebody else. Oh, Can I help you man? If God wants you to be them, Jesus. he would have made you them. There's a difference to somebody right Jesus. there. We waste a whole lot of time Jesus. looking at other folks, yeah. wishing we had what they had, oh, no. doing what they do, yeah. had the kind of faith like they got. All the while, you don't even know they got a jacked up face, right? Because <laughs> they're the hands being raised. Hands being raised, they say, how do you do? Some folks just may have a pain, they got this. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Paul, Paul says, I cannot, cannot, and I will not bring myself to the place oh. where I base my value. Oh, no. Oh, somebody.
somebody else in the world. I want you to go to the context now. So you don't forget it. The context is Paul's authority is being slandered. And the truth of God is being twisted. To that, Paul says, I will not let the views of other people become the views that I have for myself. The false teachers have formed their own ideas as to who belongs to God, who belongs to Christ, and, and what constitutes spiritual acts. Mm. You're only spiritual if you talk in tongues. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're only saved if you talk in tongues. My Lord, my Lord. You only say if you dress down your ankles. Oh, Lord Jesus. Mm. Mm. Oh, Lord, I'm like, come on, come on. You can't be saved because you listen to secular music. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Mm. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. He said, there's some folk around you Jesus. who have constructed this idea of spirituality. Yeah. Come on, come on. And they want their view. Yes. To now be your enemy. Right. And if you don't agree with what they're doing, you have now been betrayed to them. Boy, I'm preaching a whole lot of things in your shot. And he says, I want you to understand something. When folks think like right that, all they're doing is cutting themselves off yes, from yes. shattering. And the wider experience yes. of the Holy Spirit of God yes. has been given to the church. But yes. your mind is so narrow to believe oh, yes. that you can determine who is in and who ain't in. Oh. And your mind is so narrow to believe that you can determine who is saved and who ain't saved. Oh. You have shut yourself off Amen. from what the Holy Spirit of God is able to do in your life. Amen. And I don't know who I'm talking to. Yeah. <laughs> 
tragic part is, George, some folk have fallen for the love. But here's the good news. He, he said, but we have weapons. Well, we have weapons. That word but is a negative conjunction. That can refute everything before. That will destroy every proud option. That keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey God. Now let me talk to you for a moment. Because knowing God is not this exercise and in information overload. <laughs> knowing God is not this mental exercise that we take about doing all these devotions just to say we did them. <laughs> knowing God is in a space of intimacy with yes, God. God. But the Spirit of God is changing not who God is, but changing who I am in the nature of who God is in my life. That's when you know you know God. That's and you can look at yourself and say, I've jacked up on the floor to God. Let all of me and exactly who you can know God. The God is going to change how you see yourself and who you are in your life. That's when you know God. So you start to know God and you can four or five more spirits. You know God based on how the Spirit of God is transforming your life into the very image of God. And I don't know who I'm going to do. Somebody has designed themselves just to say, I go to church. Go to church, man. No. You have to now let the Spirit of God get down in you but you recognize I am the church. When I come to the point of the night, whatever I show up, the power of God will always be. Oh, 
Thank <laughs> you.